I'm your host, Neil Howard, here on Health Professional Radio. Thank you for joining us again. We're going to be talking with Dr. Tracy Fretch this morning. She's a rheumatologist from the University of Utah, and she's joining us on the program to talk about her work to address systemic sclerosis. Welcome to Health Professional Radio, Dr. Tracy Fretch, and thank you for taking the time this morning. Thank you for having me. Now, you're, you're a rheumatologist. Um, is that what was that your interest going into medicine? Yes, actually, um, I was board certified in uh, internal medicine and pediatrics. So I, I went into work with uh, patients throughout the uh, life spectrum. And through um, training, I was very interested in rheumatic disease uh, because there was a great opportunity for making patients better, a lot of discoveries still to be had. And um, I uh, started a rheumatology fellowship um, with the intention of doing adult and pediatrics, uh, but focused on um, mainly adults or 16 years and up after um, becoming very interested in taking care of systemic sclerosis patients. Most of our listeners are healthcare providers in one way or another, but explain to us what is sclerosis? Sure. So um, systemic sclerosis is an autoimmune disease where the body's smallest blood vessels respond to either um, a genetic insult or an infectious insult or an intrinsic vascular problem with fibrosis. So it's a vasculopathy or abnormality of the vasculature with resultant uh, fibrosis, which is um, driven by that uh, vascular insult. There is a variable amount of uh, inflammation, but uh, certainly Im immune dysregulation is evidenced by scleroderma-specific autoantibodies. How many um, folks in the United States would you say are suffering from systemic sclerosis uh, as we're speaking? And that's a great question because we do believe when the American College of Rheumatology uh, changed the classification criteria in 2013, mm -hmm. our providers got a lot better at diagnosing the condition by really focusing more on the vascular aspects disease. So uh, the incidence is about 20 per million with about um, a prevalence of 1 to 5 per 10,000. Um, and um, we really have seen an increase um, in incident cases, but we believe that's because our providers are getting so good at looking at patients who have Raynaud's phenomenon, which is the most common symptom in these patients, um, and doing more of an investigative uh, look with autoantibodies, capillaroscopy, and referral to rheumatology so we can make a diagnosis uh, earlier. Is the fact that it is so um, complex with all of the other uh, things that um, go on once you're diagnosed or once you have sclerosis, make it, this is one of the most, I guess, deadly autoimmune disorders that um, it's my understanding. Is that is that correct? You are absolutely correct. And, and the, the real challenge is there's a variable amount of vasculopathy, fibrosis, and uh, inflammation or immune dysregulation in each patient. And each of that can occur in different organs. So it's called scleroderma because uh, we, when we're examining the, the patient, you can see skin changes. But with people um, in uh, early disease and or limited subset of skin involvement, they may not have that very aggressive or um, uh, noticeable change in their skin. And so it does require more investigative work, such as screening for pulmonary hypertension or interstitial lung disease. And those can be leading causes of mortality in this patient population. Um, patients can have change on their CT of their chest with fibrosis without um, a lot of symptoms. So it, it, it does require a heightened sense of, of looking for internal organ involvement and making sure that the skin is closely examined if a patient has, again, that earliest symptom, renewed phenomenon. After um, diagnosis, um, even with vigorous treatment and, and maintenance of the disease, what is the, the life expectancy? Yes, and so we still um, base life expectancy on skin involvement. Um, mm -hmm. So a limited, when we use the term limited cutaneous system, that means that the fibrosis or skin involvement remains below the elbows and knees. And in, in large case series, we believe the 10-year survival in that patient population is 80 to 90 percent. With diffuse skin involvement, where there is involvement in the upper arms, abdomen, and thighs, the involvement, or excuse me, the 10-year uh, survival is um, lower at about 60 to 80 percent. It is important also to realize that, that sometimes there can be clues in addition to the skin involvement that can uh, portend, a, uh, portend a bad prognosis. 
For instance, um, if someone has an RNA polymerase 3 autoantibody, they may be at risk at renal crisis for renal crisis. And if, if that is not detected, that can have a high uh, mortality. Additionally, um, RNA polymerase 3 antibodies can be associated with cancer. So uh, age-appropriate cancer screening becomes incredibly important in that subset. So there are some nuances, but those are the general um, survival statistics. When should a um, healthcare provider expect a person to, to start presenting if uh, they do, in fact, um, suffer from systemic sclerosis? And we see it across the age spectrum, but mm-hmm. it tends to be more common in women. Um, the statistics will range anywhere to four to one female to male to eight to one, um, depending on different series. Um, uh, there's high peaks around the, the time of um, childbearing ages for um, uh, particularly in women, as well as menopause. So um, we do see the, that this is tends to be in the systemic sclerosis form, more common in the adult population. Um, but as someone who uh, will go over to the pediatrics hospital, I can assure you that the, we do see uh, child onset cases. How often is um, treatment of one system or another done without knowing that it's, it is uh, systemic sclerosis in the outset? How many, um, is it, is it normal to have several misdiagnoses? And that's a great question, too. Um, yes, because the first symptom in most patients is the Raynaud's phenomenon, and that's where the fingers go red, white, and blue. And the real challenge with that is, is that can be a, a normal symptom. So in the general population, 8% of the general population can have this symptom. Usually, though, what will trigger uh, a referral to rheumatology or bring concern is if that Raynaud's phenomenon becomes associated with really puffy hands or a digital ulceration. And in that case, if the hands are puffy, oftentimes it can be misdiagnosed as rheumatoid arthritis because the the small joints of the hand will look swollen. And so a patient may be told they have rheumatoid arthritis or an inflammatory arthritis and get started on a treatment for that. Now, um, the good news is is that um, uh, sometimes can work and and treat skin thickening. However, um, the concern, of course, is when it's misdiagnosed, um, if a patient in fact is developing systemic sclerosis, and they have interstitial lung disease, the treatments for the joints will not influence or treat the lungs. And so that misdiagnosis can lead to a lag phase until um, the proper diagnosis allows you to initiate treatment for that more, um, the most important feature would be that lung involvement. So Again, misdiagnosis is common. Sometimes there's no, no problem if, if only skin involvement is present. The same treatments can sometimes have an effect on skin involvement. But the, the, the real importance of a diagnosis is systemic sclerosis, that internal organ screening in the form of pulmonary function tests and echocardiogram so that treatment can be initiated specifically for those scleroderma features. Now, you've teamed up with Corbis Pharmaceuticals. Briefly explain um, how Corbis Pharmaceuticals is at, is at the uh, forefront of uh, research and treatment of SSC. Absolutely. So um, I became interested in uh, doing a, a clinical trial for Corbis Pharmaceuticals, um, mainly because I had many patients who came to our center asking about what was the role of, of cannabis or a CBD oil. And so um, it was a question I got quite a bit. And Corbis was investigating the endocannabinoid system. And importantly, they were developing a product or had developed a product that targeted the CB2 receptor. And um, just uh, some basics on cannabinoids, the big concern with uh, THC or cannabis is it engages uh, CB1 receptors, which are in the central nervous system and um, can cause uh, psychosis and some other um, non medicinal benefit uh, side effects. And so the, the interest, of course, is can you use the endocannabinoid system to um, engage the um, body in a way where you would have a positive uh, effect with the avoidance of adverse effects? And um, after I had written a, a review article on the endocannabinoid system and heard about Corbis Pharmaceuticals doing this trial, um, I asked if we could participate or be a, a center um, in that phase two trial, and, and we were. 
And through my um, work with with patients in the trial and my my work with the company, I felt that good information about the endocannabinoid system is really important to to, um, put out there. So I I don't work for Corbis, and um, they they don't give me any money. I donate all that to the Scleroderma Foundation. But I do work with them to try to get good materials out there to both providers and patients on how medications that are going to engage the cannabinoid system um, are in their best interest or not in their best interest. And, um, of course, Corpus's phase three is ongoing right now. Um, hope to have results uh, in the summer, this coming summer. Um, so can't speak to the results, but um, have had a good experience with trying to get good information to patients with them sponsoring that. Dr. Fretch, thank you so much for joining us here on Health Professional Radio. Thank you so very much. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Audio copies of this conversation are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.